I'm going to read some poems and tell some stories. If you like the poems, you can do what we do in Philly. We could snap. I come from a family of farmers, caretakers, cops, and church singers. My inheritance is the handmade vernacular that fell from the lips of these unsung blacksmiths of slang. They taught me the smack and the sensuality of language. When I was nine, my great-grandmother, Christine Lewis Johnson, the lady with the big corsage on her shirt, she told me on her deathbed, you have a gift, use it. I spent many of my childhood weekends with Christine, who I call Grams, in her home on Maple Street in Ambler, PA, a small town 16 miles north of Philadelphia. I didn't know it then, but Ambler was once known as the asbestos capital of the world and one of the EPA's nine most hazardous waste sites. The Beau Ritt asbestos site lies behind my great-grandmother's house this house where she raised children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren once served as the EPA's office for the cleanup. A friend once teased me about setting out to be a locally known poet as opposed to a nationally known poet. He said, I'm like Batman, and Ambler and Philly are my Gothams. At first, I didn't like the comparison. Batman has never been my favorite superhero. I'm more a storm kind of girl. <laughs> but eventually, I fell in love with the comparison because I know when and how I became a poet of people in place. It was coming back to Ambler as a grown woman and reading the warning signs that my great-grandmother's house, which she had worked for decades to own, was now part of a wasteland. If I have any superpower at all, it's my ability to see this wasteland everywhere I go, to recognize its beauty and ugliness and alchemize them into poetry. One Friday night, 20 years ago, I was hosting a poetry reading in an art gallery in Old City, Philadelphia, when in walked the man who would become my life partner my bass player, and the Alfred Pennyworth to my Batman. You could say it was love at first sight. My first thought when I saw him was, this man could take me places I've never been. And it wasn't just because of the t-shirt. <laughs> we met at a fish fry poetry reading inside the food truck of life. I was pickling poems and poaching poets as the host. You walked in on a rotisserie spit carried by a pig-roasted friend. I wanted to flash pasteurize you, <laughs> peel back your pellicle, egg wash your livers, marinate you in Kahlua and miso, stick you in my earth oven for all eternity. That was a Friday and there was some leftovers of you to baste and braise on Saturday. <laughs> Your bellican barbecue roasting and boasting in a casserole of adoration. The coddled kimchi of your affections down in my gut, where family cycles were deglazed and dredged and curdled to a funky cheese you gladly dipped your cracker in. <laughs> and this creamin' and curin' is what I signed up for. This runny sun and moon atop hash love, this wedding cabbage stinking up my rib cage like a sink full of chitlins, boy. I'm in a huff pace about you, day in, day out, mincing no magic, reducing no reverence. I thought he would take me places delicious places, and he did. He took me to his homeland, Belize, in Central America. He and his mom, with their pages of family photos and trees, got me thinking about what came before Ambler, 
what would come after. He took me back to my roots via the diaspora that is Philadelphia. I met my birth father for the first time on our wedding day 12 years ago in a neighbor's backyard in the Germantown section of Philadelphia. Our son Thelonious was born nine years ago in our home in Germantown. So we've made new family out of old recipes. But back to 1999, when we were young and sexy, <laughs> we moved in together, or rather, I moved into his little apartment on 43rd Street between Market and Chestnut in a neighborhood called West Philadelphia. We and some other disillusioned grad students, anarchists, and neighbors started a guerrilla poetry collective. We organized an open mic series, fed folks black beans and rice outside of a thrift store slash community church. We read our poems on subway during the rush hour, read poems in shelters on Christmas Eve. We went poetry caroling up Baltimore Ave, got yelled at outside of a laundromat. We wrote serial poems in chalk on sidewalks. It was a time when walking the city was its own kind of free jazz full of indelible connections and synergies, like an Alice Coltrane tune. Sometimes we would get hungry for the neighborhood, walk up the block towards Chestnut Street, speak to the Rev holding the light-skinned baby, ask his son to come put a new inner tube on my bike, cross Ludlow, pass the mailbox on the corner, risque video, Dino's Pizza, and the Emerald Laundromat. The fruit trucks tucked into 44th Street on the left. House eyes shut with boards, fringes of children. Once we went into a store sunk into the street, owned by a Cambodian woman. She sold everything from evening gowns to soup. Over to Walnut and 45th, where the Muslim cat sells this chicken wrapped in pita, draped in cucumber sauce. The pregnant woman behind the counter writes our order out in Arabic. We grab a juice from the freezer, I the bean and sweet potato pies. Back into the hot breath of West Philly, sun is setting. The sun, the sky is smeared squash, tangerines in a glaze. Three girls and one boy jump double dutch. A white man hustles from the video store with a black plastic bag. We look for money in the street, steal flowers from the church lawn. The shit stain from the wino is still on our step. Mr. Jim is washing a car for cash. John is cleaning his rims to Buju Bantan. Noel is talking sweetly to the big blue-eyed woman. Linda on her way to the restaurant. The sister in the wheelchair buzzes by with her headphones on. One night, a man was shot and killed on this block, right outside our thick wood door. But not today. Today is one of those days to come home from walking in the world, leave the windows open, start a pot of black beans, smoke some Alice Coltrane, cut up some fruit toenails, Hold on to the moment as if time is taking your blood pressure. In the odyssey of Philadelphia, places like 5 South 43rd Street became my crossroads, a place worthy of a thousand blues songs, a whispering gallery where you look for a god or a devil, and if you're lucky, you meet an angel waiting to prick your ears with directions. These found families, homebred poets, cousins from somewhere else, have shaped my Philly experience. Because you need brothers and sisters of your own making in the city. We need this way our bodies and voices make a poem or a tribe. Last year, I was asked by a magazine editor to write 
another poem just like 5 South 43rd Street. I stewed for a while about how to approach the impossible challenge of writing the same poem twice. Then I like, realized it was ridiculous, <laughs> especially since that little neighborhood of West Philly has changed so much, is not the same due to gentrification and development. But after a few weeks, I had a breakthrough. I finally found the words to rewrite the story of the place I used to live. When I proudly submitted the poem to the editor, he accused me of making a mockery of the assignment. He refused to publish the poem, said I had wasted his time. The notoriously rejected poem, which I just found out yesterday is, just got published, Call it West of Philly. <laughs> they asked me to write a poem like a lush life, a Johnny Hartman poem, a poem that would make your fake eyelashes fall off, a poem with the city all up in it, a poem, matter of fact, like a city, one that can only be reached by train. Yeah, write us a poem like a train, but not like Coltrane. Just write a Coltrane poem that contains the essence of the city, the way the horizon sounds like Elvin Jones playing trash trucks and cymbals. Just write a poem that contains the essence of West Philly, a poem you've already written. Write that. Write a recycled Philly poem about a Philly that doesn't exist anymore. Write the sequel. Write a new Romancing the Stone, but set it in Philly starring a black woman poet and a Belizean sailor. Write that scene where your angry neighbors shut down a fast food joint with Danny DeVito, or those motley kids discover the smirking mouth of a creek buried under 43rd. Make sure it's juicy with brotherly love and that other stuff. Drop in a cheesesteak, but make sure it's gluten-free, because <laughs> our audience is particular, you know, like people who don't like poetry. Not that you can't write what you like, but for now, write it like you love every damn inch of the city. Even the hawks and vultures and raccoons, or the characters sharpened like knives by the weak, or bruised and first frosted. Write it like you believe the city has seasons, that it can change in its deepest cracks, unseen corners. Write like you know these corners, you know why this building is painted pink, why this one is empty, why this one is a missing tooth on the block. Write it like you know what it's like for a tooth to be taken. Write it like you know what it's like for a home to be lost. Or try writing it like you take the voices of lost homes to bed with you, like they are evidence and you are a detective, like they are memories and you are family. Write it like you can see beyond seeing, like you can decode the origin of three-pointed stars hunched under street lights, like you are related to the men selling socks and incense oils and belts, like you can read the compass on all their faces. You can recreate the arpeggios of the one-eyed singer or the $200 upright with beer-colored keys in the thrift store. Just write a poem like a second-hand store full of dishes and leather jackets vibrating with the leftovers of people, bleeding in solidarity with a woman in a ripped red sweater like an ear wailing in the street one summer night. A poem full of peach seeds and lightning bugs a poem that can change the color of the sky. The poet Muriel Ruckheiser once said, in school, we are taught how precious poetry is, how important it is to civilization, but we are not told how to use it. My poetic practice has meant writing poetry and using it just like Grams told me, performing it, teaching it, celebrating it, living it. 
Poetry is my engine of social change and a profound way of doing good in the world. Leading festivals and workshops, I've witnessed and used the power of poetry to make families out of connoisseurs, strangers, even cynics. My Philly love story has afforded me the belief that poetry is a people's art. There's a poem and a poetry for everybody. Poetry is a container, Grecian urn, jar on the hill overrun with weeds, dirty laundry basket, bottle of beer on the back porch, a container that holds everything we most fear and desire. We should seek out poetry in our daily lives. We should reach for poems the way we reach for lovers, vitamins, painkillers, cell phones. Telling the story that can't be told, poetry is good for that. Poetry is my act of self, family, and neighborhood preservation. When somebody asks, can I get a witness? Poetry answers. Thank you. <laughs>